Okay, in the second part of this lecture, we're going to look at applications of DNA-based biotechnology as they apply to modern agriculture. And this takes uh, form in um, various different applications, including uh, DNA sequencing and advanced genomics as it's applied to advanced breeding to develop new varieties according to what I said in the previous lecture new methods for developing new hybrids and accelerating uh, those developments. But I want to take a good deal of uh, this part to examine the more specific techniques of using uh, gene cloning as it applies to introducing new traits. Do you eat genetically modified foods? Lately, I've been going up to people at random. I feel like doing a Jay Leno style interview and saying, what is a GMO? And as I've been doing this to people, most people, they answer, they say, I don't know, but I'm against it. I'm like, you don't know, but you're against it. That's pretty interesting. GMO stands for genetically modified organisms. Do you eat genetically modified foods? Certainly you do. If not, uh, you're practicing some various rigorous selection in the grocery store in order to avoid them. Um, let me point out why. First of all, uh, over 90% of the U.S. maize crop is genetically modified and probably produced as hybrids. And as I pointed out, hybrids are the product of conventional breeding, but the genetic modification is the, the introduction of specific clone fragments of DNA for specific traits, and I'll get into how that's accomplished in a minute. Uh, similarly, an equal amount or above percentage of soybean, uh, a large amount of canola, and most cotton produced by the U.S. is genetically modified. So those four crops in particular, but we can see other examples in other minor crops as well. So using the techniques of genetic modification has been broadly applied to maize, uh, soybean, um, cotton, and canola. So any products then that are made with corn or soybean, you can expect that these are derived from genetically modified crops. And this has been going on for uh, more than 15 years on a large scale. So if you look at these kinds of um, products in your grocery store, most of them uh, contain some ingredient that was made from genetically modified crops. Anything with corn in it, anything with high fructose corn syrup, has to probably contain uh, plants that were genetically modified. Oh, you say, is this bad? Well, you know, um, how can this be? So if you look at all of the products now that contain genetically modified ingredients, it would include anything with, uh, certainly anything with high fructose corn syrup in it, and that's a controversial topic all into itself. Should we be consuming high fructose corn syrup in the volumes that we are? Should we be consuming um, the large amounts of sugar that we are? That's a separate question. We produce these crops. That's the question I want to focus on. Uh, is there a problem specifically uh, with the production of these crops? So if you say this, Coca-Cola contains high fructose corn syrup, that product is derived probably from genetically modified plants. Or you might think cran apple juice or cranberry juice. Ocean spray cranberry juice, does it contain genetically modified ingredients? Well, it doesn't say so. They're not labeled, but I see here that it contains high fructose corn syrup. So was that derived from a genetically modified product? I really don't know, but uh, probably, right? Is it bad for you? I can't see why, and I'll show you in a minute. But all of these different products probably contain ingredients from genetically modified plant infant formulas, um, candy bars, um, 
corn oil, canola oil, etc. Now, whether or not these, you can say, oh, should we be consuming uh, these types of things? That's a nutrition question. And actually, that's a good question all into itself. How do we eat? Uh, why do we eat what we eat? That's a question now that is looming large in America itself. If you consider the amount of sugar in this bottle of Coca-Cola, it's astounding. Um, who would take, you know, it's imagine if you saw a guy in a diner sit down with a cup of coffee and pour the amount of sugar that is in this container. You can look at it in terms of the grams of sugar, and I did that, and I weighed it out into this container, and that's how much sugar is in that container. You know, that you consume one of these every time you drink a Coca-Cola. So, uh, certainly, the introduction of genetically modified ingredients in our foods is pervasive. So the answer would be yes, you do consume genetically modified products. I asked you before uh, what foods or ingredients did you avoid eating less of, and this was from a survey by the IFIC, and a large number of people checked off sugars, other ones fats and cholesterols, some animal products, other ones salt, diminishing their salt. But very few people actually said biotechnology products or GMOs. Um, you can avoid GMOs if you strictly eat organic. Now the organic industry is something I will talk about uh, in a lecture the next time. Uh, but for right now, the rules for organic mean that it is grown without synthetic pesticides, it is grown without synthetic fertilizer, and it does not contain GMOs. We will consider the organic industrial complex in the next uh, lecture and what that means uh, towards both production and health and inference. But for right now, if you wanted to avoid GMOs, if you think for some reason that uh, that's your choice, then you can look at bags that are certified organic, such as this one, and right on here it says all natural, no preservatives, gluten-free, GMO-free corn. Uh, so you can find products like that. And much has been said about the fact that these products, even though they contain genetically modified ingredients, are not labeled as such. These do not say on them this product contains ingredients from genetically modified plants. We will get into that also in the next lecture as to why that is so and if that's controversial. But very few people in this response to the IFIC responded that they were avoiding biotechnology products. Okay, so what is it? What is it? Before we decide whether or not this is good or bad or uh, how it influences us, perhaps we ought to know what the process is itself. Let's have an understanding of genetically modified organisms. How is it done? How do we do this? How do we clone DNA and move it into plants? What are the goals of doing that? Why should we bother to do that? Isn't there enough DNA in plants? Isn't there enough variation? Evidently not from the varieties that I showed you before. Those don't exist in the wild. So why would we now want to choose traits that are outside of that gene pool to put them into plants? What's been done so far? All of these contain ingredients from genetically modified plants. Uh, what has been done and why? What's the future going to bring in terms of this technology? And in the next lecture, I'll just touch on this now, but what are the controversies and concerns? I mentioned one, labeling, uh, but there are other ideas that could come up about this kind of a technology. Should we do it? Why should we do it? What's the environmental consequence? Is there a health consequence? What's the long-term effects? Will it increase pesticide use or decrease pesticide use? Is it good for the land? 
Is it good for humans? Et cetera, et cetera. We've already seen that humans have intervened just with agriculture alone. So with agriculture comes civilization, and with civilization, a whole lot of other problems, as well as a lot of good things. So we have already intervened. We have already domesticated wild plants. And we have used genetics and selection. We've used breeding. We've used the concepts of heredity. And now we've become more advanced on those concepts. And now, DNA technology. So I mentioned what were the most important, crucial events in human history, that fire was one of these, that agriculture and written language were some other ones of these. Well, you know what? I actually would put DNA technology on that short list. What were the most important events of the last century? I ask this sometimes, too. Penicillin is on that list sometimes. Landing on the moon is often on that list. Um, nuclear power is sometimes on that list. I would suggest that knowing the structure of DNA should also be on that list. Future generations will look back at this and say they were the ones that discovered the structure of DNA. And in fact, none of you are going to go to the moon. I will bet this. The moon's a rock. That was a great thing to get there and back. There's no doubt about that. But understanding all of the DNA in humans, well, landing on the moon pales in significance. You will never go to the moon. But knowing the structure of DNA and how to manipulate it will affect everybody in this room and future generations in many different ways. So now there are all of these terms we see in the grocery store. We have conventional foods. We have processed foods. We have organic foods. We have natural foods. We have whole foods. Some of these defy definitions. What actually is a natural food? What's a natural food, really? I mean, I think some people assume that there's something different between a tomato and a Twinkie. But really? Where, you know, you don't see too many signs for the unnatural food section or the supernatural food section. I don't know uh, what, this, what this really means here. Organic foods have a definite uh, designation. But this can be confusing. And now we've got this idea that positions conventional farming against organic farming. And this is almost polarizing. And in some cases, it seems nearly religious uh, that people opt for this or that. Uh, and as I think Michael Poland's book points out in The Omnivore's Dilemma, that whenever you get into these aspects large scale, you will see uh, positives and negatives to both sides. And it's not simple. Should we go all organic? Really? Can we do that? Really? Really? Some people say yes. Um, are there good sides to doing that? Yeah. Are there uh, deleterious sides to doing that? Possibly. It depends on the goal. What do you want? As Michael Poland points out, a Big Mac is cheaper than a bunch of broccoli. How can we do that? So. Those are all policy issues that are confounded by large-scale agriculture, production, government, subsidies. What do we want? Some people will say we just want good food. I'm not sure about that. Americans seem to just want food, some form or another. But 
what we're concerned with here are the techniques involving agriculture. And in particular, what we're concerned with are DNA-based techniques. So we move out of the realm of just conventional breeding and selection into now the technology that uses DNA and DNA-based technologies. So I mentioned that there is this whole aspect now about being able to sequence whole genomes very quickly and very cheaply and apply that towards developing new varieties. Our lab is involved with this in terms of applying this to switchgrass for use in biofuels. And that's something I'll also talk about next week. But the ability to clone fragments of DNA specifically has uh, been a large part of the controversy about GMOs and food. So I, I want to clarify that. I want to get into how it's done, what has been done, and what likely can be done in the future. So agricultural biotechnology is in itself a controversial topic because of this. Some people either see it as a panacea that will cure a lot of agricultural wo woes, bring new varieties and increase health and nutrition and decrease water use and pesticide use, and other people protest. There was just a protester arrested in the UK last week for trying to tear down a crop of genetically modified wheat that's being tested there. So, what would send somebody out on the street to protest genetically modified plants? It must be pretty intense, right? So GMOs stands for Genetically Modified Organism. And we can say that that name itself must have some sort of a public perception issue all unto itself. Do you want to eat a genetically modified organism? Hmm. But how is it done? We can say now that it's possible to clone any gene from any organism and move it into plants. If I wanted to, I could take a sample from you, a DNA sample, say a blood sample, isolate your DNA, clone the gene that codes for your hemoglobin. That would take mm, about a week, nine days. I then could put that into an expression cassette that would allow that gene for your hemoglobin to be expressed in plants. I could introduce that into corn cells and grow back an entire corn plant that would be expressing your gene for hemoglobin. That would take nine months. Now, actually, I have better things to do, and I can't understand really why I would want to do that, but that's an example of how this technology could be applied. It's possible to clone any piece of DNA from any organism and move that into plants. That's the fact. So what are the risks and benefits in food? Let's think about this. I've had people say to me, I don't want to eat any genes. Oh, really? How do you get away with that one? Or I don't want to be mixing the genes of fish and plants. Oh, you eat your salmon with your lettuce, don't you? You know, this is absurd, really, some of these things, you know. Um, so let's understand this in terms of its technology. When we say we clone a piece of DNA, what am I really saying? Well, Boyer, Cohen, and Berg were investigating enzymes that cut pieces of DNA in the early 1970s at the University of San Francisco. And these enzymes they isolated from bacteria would cut DNA at specific sequences. And they were looking at these circular pieces of DNA called plasmids. And they discovered an enzyme that would recognize a certain sequence in the DNA and cut it. Therefore, it would open up that plasmid, that circular piece of DNA, and linearize it. They also knew that there was another enzyme called a ligase that was capable of pasting DNA back together. So what did Boyer, Cohen, and Berg really discover? How to cut and paste DNA. Almost like a Word document. We can cut and paste. So they could open this thing up and they could close it back up. Now why was this significant? Well, in terms of plasmids, these things can be shared between bacteria, uh, moving genes back and forth between bacteria. And some of these plasmids contain genes that would cause the bacteria to be antibiotic resistant. 
So any of the plasmids that were grown in the presence of the antibiotic would survive. Those that didn't have that plasmid uh, would be killed by the antibiotic. This was important to Boyer, Cohen, and Berg because they realized that they could cut open that piece of DNA with the enzyme and then paste it back together and it didn't matter the origin of the DNA. They could open up that plasmid and paste the same plasmid back together, but they could also cut a piece of DNA from one organism and paste it to the DNA of another organism. So if you look at this example, we have DNA on uh, the left shown in gray, and this enzyme called ECOR1 from E. coli opens up the sequence at AATT causing a double-stranded break, an overhanging break. And in the yellow DNA, it recognizes the same sequence. So that enzyme does not care whether it is seeing gray DNA or yellow DNA, human DNA or plant DNA, or frog DNA. It's going to see the sequence AATT and make this overhanging cut. And then when they take the yellow DNA and the gray DNA and apply the ligase, it uh, recombines that DNA back according to that sequence where the A's match up with T's and the T's match up with A's and the ligation is complete to make a recombination event between the yellow DNA and the gray DNA. Hence recombinant DNA was born in 1972 by experiments done by Boyer, Cohen, and Berg, who then went on to found the company Genentech. So they discovered this ability to cut and paste DNA. So how is a gene cloned? Well, I mentioned your hemoglobin gene. Let's say now that's shown in orange here. That's a sequence of DNA. Let's say it's about 1,500 base pairs long. I'm just guessing, something like that. And I cut out his DNA for his hemoglobin gene. And I open up this plasmid with the same enzyme that I cut his DNA out with. Therefore, I have this overhanging stretch of DNA. I use the ligase then to patch his DNA into that plasmid, as shown up in this slide. Now that plasmid has an antibiotic resistance gene on it, shown in purple. So that will allow any bacteria that receives that plasmid to divide and grow in the presence of the antibiotic. Anyone that doesn't will be killed off. So we put that plasmid into a, a host and grow it in the presence of that antibiotic. All the ones that don't receive the plasmid with his hemoglobin gene in it are killed off. The ones that do copy his hemoglobin gene overnight a billion times. So now instead of having one hemoglobin gene, uh, a needle in a haystack, I've got a whole vat full overnight. And all I need to do is to add that enzyme back and it cuts back out his hemoglobin gene so instead of just having one sequence now I've copied it. I've cloned it. So I'm going to use that word cloning in two ways in this course. One is to copy a piece of DNA. We can clone it. The other way I already used in the previous lecture when I talked about apples. We propagate apples vegetatively, don't we? That's a clone. A clone is an asexual propagule. And now we can do this in animals as well. So I'm going to use that word two ways. A clone of a gene is a copy. We used to say like a Xerox copy. But it's a copy of information. And the information in a gene codes for a protein. So we can copy the information in DNA that codes for a protein many, other, many, more, many, many times over by the method shown here. And it's straightforward and routine, and we do this all the time. We can also cut and paste other pieces of DNA. So that in a gene, there is more to a gene than just the coding region that codes for a protein. Upstream from the coding region, <clears throat> we find a region that's referred to as a promoter. This is the, gene, this is the part of a, a gene that's involved in cell specificity. So there are some genes in a human that are expressed only in your eye. And we would suspect that these have an eye-specific promoter. 
There are other genes that are only expressed in the liver, and these would have a liver-specific promoter. There are some genes that are expressed in every single cell, constitutively, we would say. And those would have a constitutively expressed promoter that would be recognized in every cell. Similarly, in plants, we would have leaf-specific promoters that guide the expression of leaf-specific genes. We have root-specific promoters, flower-specific promoters, etc. So we can cut a promoter and paste it onto any piece of DNA we want. So I take a leaf-specific promoter from corn and ligate it to the gene for his hemoglobin. Now, that switch that's on in corn leaves will trigger the expression of his hemoglobin gene. Downstream from this, we have a termination signal, which stops transcription of that gene and also stabilizes the messenger RNA. This then, what we've made, is it what we call a transgene. It's a synthetically produced piece of DNA that we can use to control the expression of foreign DNA into an organism where we we're going to introduce it. So this was invented uh, during the early 1970s, widely used in bacteria and then eventually in higher organisms uh, such as other eukaryotes, besides plants, so plants, animals, and fungi. Here's a brief history of plant gene transfer and genetic engineering in this way, and I start this off in 1953 with Watson and Crick discovering that DNA was the double helix. And I described that in the first part of this class, in the first 14 lectures, so I won't dwell on it here. But also um, pertinent to plant genetic engineering here, we see that Stewart, working at Cornell University, demonstrated that you could grow back entire plants from a single cell um, in carrot. Um, actually, uh, He's, we, we can say he sort of demonstrated that because it was really Hildebrandt and Vasile that demonstrated the property of totipotency in plants from a single cell. That a single cell could then be regenerated into a whole plant. And this is very important for other biotechnology applications that I'll get into later. That all of the DNA for an organism is present in every single cell. Every single cell in you has a copy of all of your DNA. And that's the same in every single cell in you. So a human has 3 billion base pairs of DNA, about 24,567 genes. But that DNA is the same in every cell in your body. And the same is true for plants. And if you think that, oh, it's just a plant, most plants have more DNA than you do. So the first cloning techniques for DNA, Boyer, Cohen, and Berg, was in 1972. And then in 1983, Palmiter and Brinster discovered that you could take cloned fragments of DNA, inject them into a mouse embryo, and have the first genetically engineered mouse. Transferring a transgene into a mouse embryo and generating genetically modified mice was done in 1983. The first genetically modified animal in 1983, and in 1984, four groups around the world made the first genetically engineered plants. No one's quite decided who actually paved the way for that, and no one received a Nobel Prize for that, surprisingly, in spite of the large impact that it's had on world agriculture. Mark Van Montague's group was working in Ghent, Belgium, and they were among the first group of people to do this. Uh, Virginia Walbit's group, in uh, St. Louis, uh, Bob Fraley and his group working uh, for Monsanto, also in St. Louis. And there was also um, an investigator, Eugene Nestor, who developed some of the primary technology to accomplish this. So no one's actually sorted out who made the first genetically engineered plant, but this, accomplished, this was accomplished in tobacco plants, and they used tobacco not guided by the tobacco industry, but because it was uh, useful in the laboratory. It was like a, a, a white lab rat at that point. It was easily um, cultured in the lab and amenable to these technologies. 
And what they used to do this was they inserted a transgene, an artificial gene that coded for antibiotic resistance that would kill the plant if it didn't have the gene. Uh, and it was canamycin resistance. And they put that into a bacterium which normally delivers, plant, delivers its DNA into plants and causes the disease called crown gall disease. So there is this naturally occurring, there I use the word natural, there's a naturally occurring soil bacterium uh, called Agrobacterium tumefaciens that causes crown gall disease by delivering its DNA and infecting a plant with its DNA. So what these researchers did was to disarm naturally occurring agrobacterium DNA and inserted foreign DNA so that they used agrobacterium to deliver its payload of DNA to genetically modify the plant, selecting for those cells that got it by using the antibiotic resistance marker. Those plants that received the DNA lived, those that did not were killed off. And that was in 1984. And in 1984, Agrobacterium only infected and only delivered its DNA, it was thought, to dicot plants. Those would be plants with net veined leaves, tobacco, for example, uh, but all of the dicot plants. So if you consider most of the major crops of the world are monocots, the cereal grains, those were not amenable to this technique of genetic engineering worked out by these folks in 1984. So along comes this researcher named John, S John Sanford uh, and his postdoc, Ted Klein. And they were interested in delivering DNA to plants in which agrobacterium did not infect. And there were a lot of people around the planet working on this at the time. And what they developed was a technique that came to be known as the gene gun. And what they did, rather creatively, was to put foreign DNA onto the outside of particles of a heavy metal. They used tungsten, but you can use gold. And they used a modified 22 caliber pistol to accelerate these particles into plant cells where the DNA came off and transfected the plant. And in using that technique, Researchers down the road from here, working at Pfizer in collaboration with a corn seed company called DeKalb Genetics, made the first genetically engineered corn plants in the year 1990. Those were commercialized in 1995 and now have found their way into virtually every product in your grocery store. It's making a long story really short. But what do we need actually to do that? I wouldn't suggest you take this up as a hobby in your garage over the weekend because it's rather sophisticated. You don't have to worry about, uh, say, somebody just willy-nilly genetically modifying plants and uh, just letting them go. Um, what do we need? There's really four basic components. We need a tissue culture system in which you can regenerate plants from single cells. You need to be able to make those gene constructs, those artificial transgenes that I just described. You need a method for delivering the DNA, either using agrobacterium as a vector or a direct DNA uptake like the gene gun, which is also called microprojectile bombardment, or other techniques. And you also need a way of selecting those cells that receive and integrate the DNA into their genome away from those that did not. So a selectable marker is required. And that can either be an antibiotic resistance that would kill untransformed cells, or it could be an herbicide resistance marker that would kill uh, plant cells that do not have the resistance to that. So again, backing up just quickly to go over this, the cloning of plants, so-called, from single cells uh, demonstrates the ability of totipotency that the DNA for an organism is contained within a single cell. This will become important later when also we discuss animal cloning. But uh, growing back a mature carrot plant uh, from an isolated single cell was accomplished during the 1950s. And this also uh, started to accelerate the science involved with tissue culture itself, 
Growing cells in culture is underestimated by most people who are not plant cell biologists. Um, stem cell culture is considered pretty sophisticated. Well, you know, plant cell culture is underestimated because most people underestimate plants themselves. And as a plant biologist, I'll be more than happy to point out their sophistications whenever given the opportunity. So these regenerable cell culture systems were worked out furiously by groups around the planet. Um, during the early 1960s, people like Marishigi and Skoog working on defining the media down to micro and macronutrients uh, in parts per million, definitively designing media that would have effects sustaining cell divisions in culture, but then shifting hormone regimes to make shoots and embryos and roots to regenerate whole plants from single cells. So those tissue culture systems were put in place during the 60s and early 70s for all kinds of plants, including the monocot plants. Next, as I said, gene constructs were capable of being constructed after 1972. So your favorite gene could simply go into this cassette. You could design things for herbicide resistance, pest resistance, drought tolerance, nutritional enhancement. And this is a short list of some of the traits that you would want to consider today. So now we have a method to cut and paste DNA. We have a method to grow back cells, plants from single cells. So if we can put the DNA into cells, uh, we're almost there. So Palmiter and Brinster injected their mouse embryo using a micro-injection needle as shown in this slide uh, in the panel on the lower right. That's a mouse embryo being injected with foreign DNA directly into its nucleus. Now the problem with plant cells is they're bounded by a cellulosic plant cell wall. And if you try to inject it, that cellulosic wall will plug up the needle, literally. And when you go to inject it, ba-boom, it blows up the plant cell. So before 1984, a lot of people blew up a lot of plant cells trying to do this. Seemed like the way to go. And uh, then there were a whole bunch of other people who decided we got to get rid of that plant cell wall. That's the major barrier. We can get, if we can get DNA in there, it should work. That was the common knowledge. So if we can make a plant cell more like an animal cell, we could be all set. So techniques were developed to de enzymatically dissolve out the plant cell wall and make what's called a protoplast, shown in that slide uh, in the upper right. And then we could inject it, we could deliver naked DNA to it, we could put it into electric fields and electroporate in DNA, we could get DNA in there. The problem was regenerating that thing back to a whole plant turned out to be a real tough technical problem. Some people did it. A woman named Carol Rhodes did it to produce the first genetically modified corn plant in the whole world. One problem, it didn't flower. So she actually got DNA in there, but until it actually could set seed and there were technical problems that resulted in that infertility that were just not able to be overcome. You might wonder how I know so much about this. That's a longer story. So this early work on plant transformation shown here in this slide was done in the laboratory of Mark Van Montagu in Ghent, Belgium. We're using agrobacterium. This fancy device here was used uh, to make discs out of leaves from tobacco and then cultured in this liquid media. Yeah, and you should flame one of these things sometime to make it uh, aseptic. It's quite the bonfire. But uh, using that device, you can make these discs uh, that could be infected with agrobacterium around their periphery, blotted dry, and then cultured in the presence of the antibiotic that was coded for by the foreign gene that was introduced, uh, in this case for neomycin resistance. And all of those cells that did not receive the DNA are killed off. Those that did could be propagated back to whole plants, each of which contain 
the gene for neomycin phosphotransferase in resistance. Therefore, the technique for delivering DNA had been discovered. And that was done using agrobacterium. And then along comes John Sanford, who develops this technique shown here in this primitive device, where this is a modified 22 caliber pistol chamber. And the DNA is delivered, here's the micropipetter, with uh, tungsten particles that are coated with naked DNA, coding for resistance to an herbicide. This then is a macro projectile, so-called, a plastic bullet is loaded into this, and a 22 caliber blank was loaded on top, and then this thing on the top here is a firing pin. So an electric charge made the blank cartridge fire, firing that plastic bullet down into a plexiglass bulletproof stop plate, and the particles went on into the cells and this made the first genetically engineered corn plant. So this then are, these are particles uh, that have been shot into plant cells. DuPont bought the rights to John Sanford's device and got rid of the guns and ammo part of that. Uh, they paid over $9 million for the rights to that patent. And, um, made this helium-driven device that was a lot more predictable. And we have one of these now in our lab out in West Kingston. You can come and see this if you want. And this made uh, for testable and reproducible parameters. And this technique from being used first on corn was then applied to wheat uh, by Vasile and Vasile at the University of Florida and other monocot plants, including barley and rice and etc. Then Japan Tobacco, working on agrobacterium, made agrobacterium accessible to monocots. So now pretty much both techniques are widely applied around the world. So we have methods to clone DNA, we can put it into cells that we can reculture, and we have methods for getting that DNA in, and we have selectable markers. So the whole process is now complete. These selectable markers, such as the one shown in this slide, were first used for herbicide resistance. So a lot of people rewrite this in history. They say like, hey, did a company like Monsanto just make herbicide resistant plants so that they could sell more herbicide? Let me tell you, no, that was not how this went. Uh, they made herbicide resistant plants because it was a marker that they could use to accomplish the technology, and by the way, this was also a product. Now, though, herbicide-resistant plants turn out to be very useful. So there, I've told you how technically it's done. We can clone pieces of DNA and move them into plants. We can clone pieces of DNA very specifically. When I hybridize a plant, any plant, we're moving chromosomes, thousands and thousands of base pairs of DNA unpredictably. In this technique, we are specifically, exquisitely cutting out a fragment of DNA that is known. And every aspect of it is known. The borders of it are known. And we're putting it into plants against a known background. We know the DNA of a tomato. Now we've introduced one fragment of DNA against that known background or corn. This is a picture of the first genetically modified plants in a greenhouse down at Pfizer. And there's the cover of the first genetically modified corn plant published in uh, the plant cell on uh, the cover issue of July 1990 by DeKalb Genetics. And again, this process from beginning to end requires Oh, seven months if you're working really fast. From uh, nine months, really, from introduction of the DNA to a seed that now contains that DNA. <coughs> the point here is kind of like I was making with the Boyer, Cohen, and Berg description. It doesn't matter whether it's frog DNA or human DNA or plant DNA. DNA is DNA. It's information. 
Foreign DNA is going to be expressed in terms of making its RNA and making its subsequent protein. It doesn't matter whether it's his hemoglobin gene or yours. The plant's going to see it as just DNA. And the genetic code is the same in most all organisms on this planet. That's an amazing fact. There are 20 amino acids on this planet that are used in all biological life. There are a couple more exceptions, but pretty much. ATG codes for methionine in most organisms. That also happens to be the start signal for most genes. So ATG is going to code for methionine as an amino acid from a human or in a corn plant. So if I take the genetic sequence of a human and put it into a corn plant, it's going to make the same protein because the codon usage spells for those same amino acids. That's a remarkable fact, by the way, that the genetic code is roughly the same for all organisms. That means that we can take any gene that codes for any protein and put it into any other organism, and the alphabet remains the same. It's very cool. Consider evolution in this context. But in terms of how we work with life, this is special. So we can clone any gene now and move a single gene or even several genes. It's possible at this point to move a whole biochemical pathway. There are also needs for being able to visualize certain genes. I said that there are promoters which control gene expression, leaf-specific promoters and root-specific promoters. Wouldn't it be good to be able to study those promoters, eye-specific promoters in humans or liver-specific promoters? We can hook up certain genes that would allow us to visualize that. That would be great, especially without killing the organism. There are certain ways we could do it with killing the organism if we made it radioactive. And that's okay, but it would be really good if we could visualize it. So a whole group of people worked on these visual markers, so-called, that we could hook up an artificial gene and visualize where that promoter was being uh, expressed. So a guy named Steve Howell, uh, working with David Au in California, clone the gene out of fireflies that make it glow in the dark, firefly luciferase. And they moved it into tobacco, as you see here, and if you give it the substrate, luciferin, the, uh, the tobacco plant glows in the dark. There was a limitation to this, though, and that's how far the luciferin would actually penetrate the plant in order to, to, to allow this. After that, a guy by the name of Martin Chalfi uh, undertook this project to clone the gene that makes jellyfish bioluminesce. So there are some organisms that bioluminesce. Some of them are co coral, some of them are uh, certain types of phytoplankton will do this, but Acoria victoria uh, bioluminesces. And Martin Chalfi wondered about this and found out that this was a protein. And hence, as a protein, there must be a gene. And he cloned the gene out of Acoria victoria that codes for the green fluorescent protein. And if you shine uh, ultraviolet light onto green fluorescent protein, it emits a green light at about 550 nanometers. Now, if you take that cloned piece of DNA and put it behind a promoter that's recognized by the bacteria E. coli, and put that into E. coli, you get glow-in-the-dark E. coli. Now you can say, you can stroke your chin and say, whoa, 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 isn't that nice? <laughs> we have glow-in-the-dark bacteria. Sounds like some sort of mad science trick. He also did the, thing, the same uh, experiment in a eukaryote, a roundworm, C. elegans, a nematode. It's a genetic model. And that was on the cover of Science and considered a scientific breakthrough in the early 1990s. But everybody was still like, well, that's kind of a cute trick, but wait a minute. Now you have a way of visualizing where promoters are expressed. And this went on to be very useful in studying gene expression as a reporter for different promoters in many different organisms. There's a glow-in-the-dark daisy 
but you can also look up the applications of green fluorescent protein. Here's a list of other promoters that have been used. Uh, there's one uh, also called GUS uh, that was developed by an Australian investigator, and it's an E. coli protein that, although not viable, when it's expressed, it causes tissues that are expressing it to turn blue. So in the lower left, you see corn kernels that are expressing that only in the endosperm behind a endosperm-specific promoter. And here's another one in corn behind an ear-specific promoter. So these can be used to uh, look at gene expression patterns. The green fluorescent protein, just to get back to that, has been useful not only in E. coli and gene expression studies in things like roundworms, C. elegans. It's also been introduced widely in plants uh, and in animals. And you can go to a GFP website and see some astounding examples of, of, of this kind of thing. And Martin Chalfie, because of his work, went on to win the Nobel Prize. So I often ask students, what was Peyton Manning's signing bonus? It's $94 million. Martin Chalfie affected world medicine and agriculture, and a Nobel Prize is $1.4 million. Now, hmm, I'll say no more. So we can, it's an example though, these reporter genes, and especially GFP, uh, that any cloned DNA can now be inserted into the chromosomes of plants, and we can make transgenic plants. And uh, gene transfer, though, although this seems rather wild uh, and unnatural, is done by lots of other organisms besides humans. In fact, bacteria transfer DNA uh, and genes between species all the time, oftentimes using viruses to do this. So now, in nature, there's another organism that's capable of transferring DNA. DNA is itself developed an organism that's capable of transferring DNA. We call that a human. So now that we can clone DNA, what kinds of traits would we want to work with to improve agricultural crops? Genes code for proteins. Proteins influence traits. That's how it happens. Some traits themselves are directly the consequence of single genes. Those become the low-hanging fruit for genetic modification. No pun intended there. So trait modification for agricultural improvement. What are the traits? I listed them in this previous diagram. Herbicide resistance. Great, you can apply an herbicide and take out the weeds. We might wonder about the herbicide itself and its consequences, but taking out the weeds increases yield. That's clear. Why? Because plants are competing with water. Any farmer knows that. Any gardener grows that. Grows that. Knows that. And you can either physically do it with an implement like a hoe, but if you've got to do that over thousands of acres, that's not very practical. So herbicide resistance allows us to spray an herbicide to take out the weeds to improve water use. Pest resistance also is a trait that can increase yield. If you have pests munching on your crops, yield goes down. So this is insect resistance, fungus resistance, virus resistance, anything out there that can attack the plants that we have so carefully selected, like the golden retriever puppy would not survive in the wild, either with the butternut squash. These, you know, the, the golden retriever puppy is like a meatball on legs out there. The same thing with the butternut squash. You think this is going to survive the onslaught of pets that would, pests that would also like to devour that butternut squash, or your apples, or virtually anything else? And then there's drought tolerance, salt tolerance, freeze tolerance, all which would increase the amount of arable land that we have accessible to us. 
And drought tolerance is becoming increasingly a more important trait as water becomes a diminishing resource. Water will become as valuable as oil. Actually, in fact, if you buy bottled water in this country, it's more expensive than gasoline. People complain about the price of gasoline. The price of gasoline is cheaper than water. And it's not even a political argument yet. Nutritional enhancement. We can increase the nutrition of crops by adding genes from other organisms. Vitamins, oils. We can even make specialty chemicals. We can make pharmaceuticals and plants. Antibodies that are used for drugs can be made in plants. Vaccines can be made in plants. Bioplastics, organic plastics can be made in plants. So you know, I've taken already a lot of time in these two lectures to discuss domestication. Domestication of tomatoes uh, occurred over thousands of years to give us the tomatoes that I, we saw in the last lecture. And like I said, I love a Burpee's Big Boy tomato. I had one last night grown by my friend. Awesome. Now we also know all of the genes in tomato. This was published just a couple of weeks ago. We know all the genes now that code for a tomato. This is wonderful. We've also had the ability to genetically modify tomatoes since the early 90s. 1992 saw the first commercially available genetically engineered plant sold in a grocery store as the flavor saver tomato. The gene that was cloned slowed down the, ripe, the, the ripening process in this tomato, increasing its shelf life. It had certain commercial flaws, but it did demonstrate that uh, the process worked and it was commercially introducible. We'll call it the Orville and Wilbur of its day. Like Orville and Wilbur didn't get on a DC-9, you know. The next traits that were introduced, herbicide tolerant crops were made. So now corn, canola, rice, cotton, soybeans uh, have ample examples that are herbicide resistance. Roundup resistance is common and uh, very useful. Roundup itself is uh, a pretty good herbicide. It's very effective and environmentally safe. And you can see examples of herbicide-resistant corn even locally grown here. And the yield is dramatically improved. Insect resistance has been introduced by cloning the gene uh, out of a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis that has a gene that codes for a protein that is toxic to leptidopterin insects. This is a gene that codes for a protein. The protein only affects leptidopterin insects. Leptidopterin insects, insects that are ca have caterpillar larvae. Think European corn borer. Uh, so you can spray using a pesticide that kills broad scale insects generally. But in this case, the gene for the Bt toxin was cloned out of Bacillus thuringiensis, put behind a promoter which allowed it to be expressed in corn. The corn made the toxin that's only toxic to leptidopterin insects. The European corn borer eats the corn, uh, hits this protein, which inserts into the midgut of the insect, causing massive water loss, and the insect dies. Now, if the insect were just munching around in the soil, it might encounter Bacillus thuringiensis uh, just growing out there. And then the same thing would happen. It would eat the spore or the bacteria, encounter the protein, and the insect would die, leaving the bacteria a nice substrate in which to produce more bacteria, and that's how the world goes around. So uh, in this case, the gene was cloned and moved into corn plants. So it's a protein, not a chemical insecticide. This is an important point when people consider this. Pesticides, chemical pesticides, kill insects indiscriminately and can have serious side effects. As a protein, 
Bacillus thuringiensis can be devoured by humans in spoonfuls. It is commonly used as an organic pesticide on tomatoes, using the spores of Bacillus thuringiensis, not the clone gene. Here's an example of transgenic corn expressing Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, the protein toxin from Bacillus thuringiensis. And they were all inoculated with European corn borer larvae into the whirl of their young leaves. The ones on the left and the right are uh, wild type plants that have not been genetically modified. And you can see the sustained damage to the leaves resulting from uh, the insect. The one in the middle is expressing the Bt toxin and has had the same inoculation with the uh, European corn borer larvae. European corn borer is a mad, massive pest on maize production in the United States. So the introduction of this trait had serious uh, commercial impact, resulting in uh, this product produced by Monsanto called Yield Guard. And uh, this was a number of years ago, and there have been subsequent varieties and improvements. Uh, such as coupling the BT gene with herbicide resistance and having two genes or more expressed in one variety at the same time. And then this is now then bred into all of the different varieties of corn that Monsanto produces. Some people say, oh, corn is a monoculture and this is bad. Well, actually, if you study maize genetics, you understand that breeders are making specific varieties for every county in Iowa. The corn that is produced in Clayton County, Iowa, is not the corn that's grown in Boone County, Iowa, even though they're only 100 miles away from each other. The corn that's grown in Minnesota is not the corn that you grow in Florida. The flowering day length is specific. So you have 90-day corn and you have 100-day corn, referring to the number of days to maturity of pollen. And all of this is intensely bred. Now we have the ability to clone pieces of DNA and breed them into all of these different varieties. So what concerns us about food safety? Is it GMOs? There has not been one substantiated human health incident resulting from GMOs since 1992 in its first introduction. If you can find an article in a peer-reviewed scientific journal which shows a substantiated human health response to a GMO, I'll give you an A. Oh, and $100. However, the same cannot be said for Mm, many other technologies. I would propose then that genetic modification is not a health threat. So you could say, what about its long-term effects? Epidemiologically, the United States has been consuming the products of GMOs for 15 or more years. If you study the effects of tobacco over that length of time, I'm sure you would see the epidemiological effects of its application. So if there were something as obvious as that, one would presume that at this point we would see that. Take the application of a drug like Vioxx, FDA approved, but then it goes large scale and we see its effects within a year or so. So I wonder the logic that questions the long-term or even short-term health effects of GMOs in plants or their products. Am I clear about that? Everybody wonders about this. So, other traits, fungus resistance. Blast is a major disease that affects rice, and rice feeds half the world. Affecting oils, 
High performance cooking oils might be one, but also healthier cooking oils. Reduce saturated fats. Also now oils that are used for biofuels. Nutritionally enhanced foods. We work on some of these projects in my lab. But Ingo Patrikas, a Swiss worker uh, working with Peter Bayer at the University of Freiburg, cloned four genes responsible for beta carotene production out of daffodil and moved these genes into rice. Vitamin A deficiencies in third world countries have serious health effects causing death, blindness, and more people. So by moving the genes for beta carotene from daffodils into rice, the idea is, is that we could ameliorate vitamin A deficiencies in developing countries. And this was called golden rice. And is, uh, even though this process was done in the 1990s. It has taken all of this time to wind its way through the regulation process and the deregulation process and the breeding process in order to get it introduced to the people that actually need it. This was covered in Time magazine in which Ingo Patrikas, and I know him personally, was on the cover of Time. Have you ever known anybody on the cover of Time magazine? It's really weird. I was walking through the airport one day, and there was Ingo Patrikas on the cover of Time magazine. I mean, imagine if you, you, know, you knew your neighbor and it was on the cover of Time magazine. It's really strange. But um, the article stated grains of hope. And you can see by the color of these, their yellow color uh, gave them their name, Golden Rice, also uh, for the promise of... Uh, affecting vitamin A deficiencies. And I was astounded that in the next issue of that, of Time magazine, on this editorial, nature has already blessed us with abundant plants that supply vitamin A. We don't need to mix the genes of daffodils and rice. Oh, really? Isn't that something? Why don't they just grow carrots? What's wrong with those people over there, anyway? Hmm. So, uh, hopefully, that kind of attitude is being overcome. And that any tools in the box that can be applied uh, should be considered uh, against its ethical consequence. Now we have this ability to work on fruits and vegetables, too. And you can see that the major crops that have been used so far are the big money makers. Maize in this country is a $58 billion plus crop a year. To be a blockbuster drug, that's $1.5 billion or more. The lettuce industry is six times that. The lettuce industry is six times that of a blockbuster drug. Maize is 50 times that. And what do we use maize for? I'm not talking about sweet corn. Sweet corn is about 0.5% of the U.S. corn crop. It doesn't even measure. The corn I've been talking about all this time is the corn that feeds cattle. Pork, poultry, same thing with soybeans. It's subsidized by the government. That's why your Big Mac is cheaper than your bunch of broccoli. Broccoli is not subsidized. But also, corn goes into all of these products. $53 billion worth of maize in this country. You could question, do we need that? Well, it meets a need. People buy this. We question our nutrition. We question our agricultural use. But these are the techniques that come to bear on agriculture. You can question how much we waste. Americans waste enough food every day to fill the Rose Bowl. Every day. So food production is one thing, food use is another thing, agriculture is another thing. But the techniques of agriculture are clear. 
This will be used, if needed, for fruit and vegetable quality development. As I mentioned, we can grow vaccines that are edible in plants. Why would this be important? Plants don't carry diseases that affect humans. And perhaps we could do this more quickly to make a vaccine than in other methods. Biofuels is another application for plants. You can say drill, baby, drill, or you could say grow, baby, grow. Uh, plants are a renewable resource with a low carbon imprint. But genetic engineering can also control complex traits. Yield is not a single gene. It's quantitative trait loci. Many different genes acting in concert. Knowing genomics and using advanced breeding technologies in concert with genetic modification will affect yield and increase the amount of grains and crops that we can produce off of arable acres. Yield yield, yield, and other challenging traits such as drought tolerance, freeze tolerance, and other abiotic stress uh, resistance are now being uh, introduced. I myself worked on drought tolerant maize for a while and uh, produced one of these early prototypes uh, which I tested out at a beach near Westerly and this is the most stress tolerant maize I could ever see. And I, pre I, I presented this one year at the maize genetics meeting, and they asked me, they said, but Dr. Couch, what does the wild type maize look like in comparison? So I had to come up with an example of my best wild type maize that I could find. So I think you can see the importance then of genetic modification and its applications towards certain traits. Can we fix everything? No. Can we fix some things? Yes. Uh, and I would propose that we need every tool in the box. And I would also suggest that if you've got a better idea, bring it on. Because we need it now. <laughs>